Um, my name is Lukas Krohn. I'm a PhD student in the lab of Laszlaw Jacowski at the University of Oxford. And I'd like to use the next 10 minutes to give you an overview of my PhD project on the effects of selective silencing of layer 5 pyramidal neurons on sleep-wake regulation and cortical network dynamics. And I hope that by the end of my presentation, I will have convinced you that not only subcortical centers, but also cortex play a role in the homeostatic regulation of sleep and wakefulness. Speaking about sleep regulation, it is essential to mention the two-process model of um, sleep regulation formulated by Alexander Bobe and Serge Stan in the early 1980s. But I think um, Russell Foster has already given a wonderful introduction on this model. What I want to emphasize is that we actually know um, a lot about the circadian process. So the molecular mechanisms are very well understood. And for these discoveries, as already mentioned, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine has been awarded. Um, and in mammals, we know very well that the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, is the central pacemaker in the brain. Um, however, um, about the homeostatic process, we neither really know the molecular counterparts nor the neural circuitry, at least in mammals. Um, I think very recent um, fruit fly data actually shows that it is possible to delineate such circuits um, in the vertebrates. Um, but we, what we know about the homeostatic process is that we have an exceptionally good marker of um, this process um, as represented by EEG slow effectivity. And um, I chose this uh, um, figure for the um, depiction of the two process model because it shows that um, after a normal wake duration, slow effectivity is increased to a certain extent, but then after uh, sleep deprivation, slow effectivity um, would have um, a market increase and then decline exponentially in both cases. Um, over the duration of sleep. So um, slow effectivity is a very good marker of sleep homeostasis. And interestingly, um, it is not um, equally distributed across the brain. But a lot of um, evidence um, suggests that it can um, be regulated on a local cortical level, as here shown in a study by Rito Huber um, who at that time at um, the lab of Chiara Cirelli and Giulio Tononi. And I think this is very difficult to reconcile this concept of local sleep with the current model of global sleep-wake regulation, which focuses on subcortical centers, especially in the brainstem, in the hypothalamus, and in the basal forebrain. And in my MD thesis, we tried to um, interfere with cortical excitability using a non-invasive brain stimulation method called transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, and we observed that if we um, it's increased excitability in the prefrontal cortex immediately before sleep, then actually subjects would sleep significantly shorter than um, after sham or deactivating stimulation. So we hypothesized that this might actually um, be a new approach to study sleep regulation and that during wakefulness, um, the um, corticothalamic feedback is mostly driven by sending arousal stimuli from um, the before mentioned systems. Whereas during sleep, cortex might actually give um, an initiating signal um, represented by um, slow oscillations in the thalamocortical feedback loop. Um, and we wanted to take this into an animal model, and we're looking for a cell population which might be suitable for intervention. And we chose layer 5 pyramidal neurons for various reasons. First of all, layer 5 pyramidal neurons are the main output from cortex. Um, but then layer 5 uh, has also been shown to generate the slow oscillation um, in this work by Sanchez Vives and McCormick. Layer 5 um, pyramidal neurons initiate and propagate uh, slow oscillations in cortical networks. Um, and it is known that um, layer 5 pyramidal neurons are the most sensitive uh, cell population in cortex to the somnogen adenosine. So we think if we want to investigate um, the effects of a cortical manipulation, um, on global sleep regulation, uh, layer 5 permanent neurons are a good candidate cell population. So my PhD focuses on um, two hypotheses. First, that neocortex plays a role in global sleep wake regulation. And second, that local cortical sleep homeostasis depends on layer 5 permanent neurons. And today I'm going to speak about the first um, of these two um, projects. So we use um, very standardized methods. We investigate sleep and wakefulness in transgenic mice. And the mouse line that I'm using in my experiments <coughs> is a layer 5 science mouse line. 
So 15 to 30 percent of neurons are functionally silent um, by removal of a T-snare protein, SNAP25. And then we perform um, EEG and laminar recordings in these animals. And I want to start showing you some um, <coughs> fairly unprocessed uh, data. Um, these are individual hypnograms from six animals, um, six controls, and six layer five science animals. And here, shown in uh, the different colors, green is um, the vigilant states of wakefulness, blue non-rapid eye movement sleep, and red rapid eye movement sleep. And you see that the control animals, as expected, show polyphasic sleep, um, a lot of sleep during the light period, and a lot of wakefulness during the dark period. Um, whereas our layer five science mice um, show these remarkably long wake episodes during the dark period, which can actually extend to up to 10 hours. So if we um, quantify these effects, we see that during the light period, we don't have a difference in the distribution of vigilant states. But then during the dark period, our transgenics are awake for almost three hours longer than the controls um, at the cost of non-rapid eye wound and rapid eye wound sleep. So to disentangle this phenotype a bit further, we then looked into the cumulative wakefulness over 24 hours. And here again, you see that during the entire light period, um, the curves are, are fairly similar between the genotypes, but then the difference actually occurs during the dark period, where um, transgenics accumulate wakefulness um, in a much steeper um, way than controls. Um, and this is also reflected in the longest individual wake episodes. So these animals really seem to have a greater capacity to maintain wakefulness. So the obvious question is, um, does this have something to do with sleep homeostasis? And in order to quantify this, um, we um, looked into the relationship between the duration of individual wake episodes and the buildup of slow effectivity. And as you see here in the controls, um, this well-described positive correlation is visible. So the longer the animals are awake, the more slow, uh, slow effectivity builds up. Um, whereas in the layer five silenced animals, um, this correlation is absent. We only have a numerically small increase in slow effectivity um, with the duration of wakefulness. So in order to perform an intervention, we now sleep deprive the animals for the first six hours of the light period, um, providing them with novel objects. And here you see the same color coding again for one individual control and one individual layer five silenced animal. And in the control, you see this um, well-described increase in slow effectivity, and then the exponential decline to baseline. And the second effect is that we see quite a lot of rebound sleep during the dark period. Whereas in the layer five science animal, we see that this um, increase in slow effectivity is diminished, and the animal wakes up at the onset of the dark period. And despite the previous sleep deprivation, we have actually long wake episodes during the dark period. And if we look into the data um, in comparison between genotypes, we see um, this decrease in slow effectivity um, in the conditional knockouts compared to controls. Um, and this is specific to low frequency, so it doesn't have anything to do with the general power. So to summarize my results, we have three main findings in this layer five silenced mouse model. We have increased in wake duration due to more wakefulness during the dark period. We have a greater capacity to maintain wakefulness and we have a reduced homeostatic response to sleep deprivation. So um, our uh, data up to now suggests that selective silencing of layer five pyramidal neurons affects global sleep regulation. And on this note, I would like to thank everyone who was involved in this project. Um, I would like to thank my current and my previous supervisors um, and especially two colleagues who really taught me all their knowledge on electrophysiology and uh, sleep, um, Mathilde Guillaumin, who uh, spoke before me, and um, Christina Blanco, who is not in this picture, but in the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucas. We have time for questions. Okay, well, I have a question. Well, an obvious. Oh. Sorry. No, it's just a background question, really. What's the cognitive capacity of these mice? 
even though they're awake for a long time, do they engage with their environment? So um, there's never been a very systematic behavioral test. So no one has ever done very systematic behavioral testing. Um, collaborators of us looked into fear conditioning and rotor tests. As far as I know, nobody has ever done any uh, uh, cognitive performance testing. Mm. But from the behavior that we can observe, so for example, nest building um, or social interaction, there's nothing um, very obvious. Um, mm. It's quite striking. I mean, because the mut mutation you're creating, you're like silencing layer five. Yeah, so we're silencing the subpopulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, every so cell. 15 to 30%. Of yeah, yeah, it's yeah. astonishing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, we, we chose the RBP4 Cree driver line because it's uh, known as the most general layer 5 um, driver line. So it expresses Cree in layer 5A and layer 5B and across cortical areas. Um, so we want to have kind of a very unbiased um, driver. Is it proportional? I mean, is there like a variation in the silencing of the percent silencing of neurons? or? Between animals or between yeah, layers? Between animals, or between lines. Yeah. Um, so we haven't, we don't quantify this in every individual animal. So uh, collaborators of us in the beginning just uh, analyzed a couple of animals and then said, well, it's between 15 and 30 percent, and that's a value which is also described in literature. Yeah. But it would be in interesting to see a dose, uh, dose response. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, do you see any changes in adenosine signaling or receptors in these mice in the sense that it's basically the signal seems to be blocked, but yet you're still having essentially homeostasis, but it's not translated? Yeah, I mean, that's a very obvious question. So one of the follow-up experiments would actually to be to do adenosine interventions in cortex. Um, I think the effects of adenosine in the basal forebrain are very well described, and also the effects of adenosine on other subcortical wake and sleep-promoting nuclei. Um, but as far as I know, the effects of adenosine on cortical uh, network dynamics are actually uh, not very well understood. Are there further questions? No? Well, if not, we can, uh, we can thank Lucas and move to the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs>